All right, we're talking about David Hume. And he is the, the ultimate empiricist. Everything is merely a sensible impression. <clears throat> so therefore, nothing is objective. We just have our own sensible experiences. So it leads to skepticism. We don't know if anything's true. We don't even know if the outside world is real. This theory leads him to embra embrace skepticism. Causation for Hume is merely an experience of one event happening in succession to another. So the billiard balls. See that when we see you know, one ball hitting another and that goes into the pocket, we do not know that this caused the movement of that, and it, that caused it going into the pocket, having been directed, of course, by the mind of the player uh, proving the final causality. See, we don't know. We just see. We, have, we see one ball hit another. We, this, we, you can't see causality, so how do we know if it exists? You can't see it? It's Hume. Famously, his own example. All we see is succession, not causality. We know from experience that heat accompanies fire. That when the will moves, certain members of the body also move. See, we can't say that the water boils because you put it on the fire. It's just... When you, when you put it on the fire, it happens a lot that the water will boil. <laughs> it's sick. It's all sick. But experience does not tell us that this is always the case and certainly does not tell us about any intimate relationship between the two events, what we call causality. We see that one event follows upon another. Post hoc, that means after this in Latin. But we do not see the connection, propter hoc, because of this. But because we have a habit of seeing one event follow upon another, for example, heating the water on the stove, we give this quasi-constant succession the name of cause and effect. From these principles, Hume concludes that our knowledge of cause and effect has no real or scientific basis. We do not know what substance is. We do not even have an idea of what it is, since we do not know if the accidents are truly the effects of the substance. So the accidents of the various elements, their behavior, their properties. We don't know if that proceeds from some internal cause. We do not know with certitude if the human soul is immaterial or immortal, since we do not know if it is the true cause of the acts which one attributes to it, such as thinking or writing philosophy, especially thought, which acts are the basis of determining the nature of the attributes of the soul? See, so you know, we don't know if thinking even comes from the soul. For the same reasons, we do, do not know whether the will is free or not. That helps when you're committing sins. All of these reasonings led Hume to the negation of the existence of God, or at least of the ability to prove his existence with certitude. 
Nonetheless, quite illogically, he believes in God, basing his belief on common sense and the instincts of human nature. So you can't prove God by, by reason, but you believe in him. You see? And Kant will say, do the same thing in a different way. That's why the Vatican I defined that you can prove the existence of God by reason because of all of this modern philosophy. And St. Paul says it, too, in his epistle. You can prove the existence of God from the things that are created. Yes? One of the 14 epistles that he wrote. <laughs> I can't remember. As Father Fleece, he teaches in sacred scripture. For Hume, nothing is ever really present to the mind except its perceptions and impression. We do not conceive of existence, but only of perceptions. There exists for us only a universe of imagination, images in our minds. And we have no idea of anything else than that which is produced in it. Naturally, metaphysics is impossible. The idea of essence and existence and causality, transcendental properties of being, one true, good, and beautiful. Since human beings cannot know essences, nor the causes of things, nor the reality of the objective value of metaphysical ideas. Here he's writing this stuff. That is metaphysics he's writing to deny metaphysics. No science is possible except what that which results from experience and the observation of phenomena. And this is what is going to cause Kant to devise his philosophy because Hume destroyed science. Science is on the rise. Look at uh, 1711 to 1776. By, by the middle of the 18th century, science is very much on the rise. And so science has to be preserved. And that's what Kant is going to attempt to do. That there, there is causality, but it's a category of your mind. See, Hume says, we can't know causality. You see, but Kant is going to say, oh, no, yes, you can. It's a category of your mind. You organize the phenomena in such a way as to say something is caused by something else. It really doesn't help science, whether you're you know, a humist saying, who knows, or Kant saying it's all in your head. Does that help science? For you, nothing is ever really present to the mind except its procession. Um, oh, yeah, we said that. Hume is therefore a precursor of the critical skepticism of Kant and of positivism. The big positivist is Auguste Comte, and we'll see him. 19th century uh, French philosopher uh, who was a disciple of Kant. He was like the French Immanuel Kant, Auguste Comte. There is a statue of him in front of the Sorbonne in Paris, which made me sick to look at. That's pop. <laughs> like Kant, who constructs a belief in God because morality needs it, so Hume puts the same credence in, in God as he does in the existence of exterior things. You see, we need to know that the money that we're putting in the bank is real. See, so we, we, there's a belief. 
It's not based on anything, but there's a belief because we need it. There is for him a certain common sense that exterior things exist. Like when you bang your head against the wall. The same goes for the existence of God. The common sense. Like Kant, Hume repudiates the existence of miracles, negates the supernatural order, and rejects all positive religions, meaning organized religions. Critique of Hume. Hume is an important figure in modern errors for many reasons. One, he perfected, quote-unquote, Locke's empiricism. Hume brought Locke's notions of sense per perceptions and ideas into their, it, it, to their logical conclusions and dealt the final blow to metaphysics, something left undone by Locke owing to his inconsistency. He destroys the notion of causality. Perhaps Hume's greatest, quote-unquote, contribution to modern error is his destruction of the notion of causality, reducing our knowledge of causes to a mere association of perceptions. This idea about causality will ruin any reasonable basis for religion. See, so then faith will become a completely blind thing. As I told you before, the church has the science of apologetics, which does not prove the faith, but it proves that the faith, that the act of faith is reasonable. See, it doesn't prove the dogmas of faith, but it proves that the act of faith is a reasonable thing, that God exists and that, that he has revealed himself, and that therefore, uh, and he has proven this revelation by miracles and prophecies, and therefore it is reasonable to make the act of faith. That's the whole science of apologetics. We'll take that probably next year. Very important course. See, so, but now religion becomes the blind leap of faith. We don't know if God exists, but... I believe it. And this, that will, that this divorce of reason from religion will be the source of modernism. So the modernist, if you read in Pashendi, is on the one hand the agnostic. That means, who knows if God exists? We can't prove him. You know, it's, the, the, he's, he accepts all of this. No miracles, nothing supernatural. That, that's his, his rationalistic side. But then there's the faith side, you see. And so St. Pius X said that they are capable of giving the most edifying sermons, saying beautiful things about Our Lady and you know, saints and whatnot. But on the other side, you know, is this, well, you know, it's, it's the, the faith is totally divorced from, from reality because their faith is based on a need for God, the religious experience. God exists because I need him. We'll see this in uh, Soren Kierkegaard, who was a Protestant, <clears throat> who, you know, infected with all of these things, early 19th century, Danish, uh, who um, his, he's famous for the blind leap of faith. He was a Protestant pastor. So faith is blind, you see, because all of this, this is true. You know, all of this destruction of metaphysics is true. So faith becomes totally divorced from reason. <clears throat> so this idea about causality will ruin any reasonable basis for religion Religion will, religion will be reduced to a non-rational or even irrational faith experience. For example, for example, it doesn't make any sense, but I believe it. See, that's irrational. 
Here we see the basis of modernism. The mind is divided between its perception knowledge and its faith knowledge. Like two different worlds, these two ways of knowing will engender a type of intellectual schizophrenia, where something could be true in the perception world, but not true in the faith world, and vice versa. So never be deceived by the faith speeches or talk or writings of a modernist like Ratzinger. Never be deceived by that. That's precisely their definition. Or JP2. I don't think Bergoglio has ever said anything pious, so you don't have to worry about him. Hume perfected modern skepticism. Hume merely brought Locke to his conclusions, thereby constructing a philosophical skepticism. This skepticism that we, we really don't know whether reality exists or not will pervade modern thought, which finds certitude about reality impossible. In the same way that the deists freed theology from authority, so Hume frees knowledge from its object. See, the mind is not subject to an object. Some single external thing that is the same for everybody. The mind is now on its own, off the leash. The result is that it does not matter what you think or believe. which is the, the, the modern dogma. Uh, Bergoglio just, uh, this encyclical I did yesterday, a uh, 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 Francis Watch show on that awful encyclical that he put out. It's loaded with this stuff. There's no objective anything. We're all uh, walking with one another in search of the truth. Kant said of Hume that he awakened me from the slumber of my dogmatism. Hume is at the root of Kantian idealism. We'll see Kant later. Kant will, since Kant will attempt to save human knowledge by constructing his system of categories, uh, uh, but he will accept Hume's skepticism as a fundamental starting point, that is, that the essences of things are impossible to know and that all we know are appearances or phenomena. He'll call them phenomena. All right, so Hume is a big figure in modern era. Big, big figure. And as I said, he spent a lot of time in Paris talking to all of the intellectual scum of Paris uh, at the time and uh, is, is a big figure in the cause of the French Revolution, I would say. Is the French Revolution uh, was primarily a, an intellectual revolution. In other words, there were some economic problems. There, there, was, there was a big famine uh, you know, some discontent economically. There, the France was uh, had spent too much money on the American War, and uh, so there was a big financial crisis. and And poor Louis the Sixteenth didn't really know how to deal with it. He was not he was not ever, ever trained to be king because his brother was supposed to be king. Uh, uh, and uh, what was his brother's name? His brother's name was. Uh, I forget his brother's name, but the but he was he was being trained to be king, but he died prematurely uh, when um, he came down with uh, smallpox and died prematurely. So all of a sudden, the the mantle of of of, of royalty went to uh, uh, Louis the Sixteenth, and uh, so he was 
And he said, I'm not prepared for this. He was a very young man, I think uh, 21 or 22 or something. Very young man when he was made king, and uh, if even that. And uh, he said, I'm not ready. I was not trained for this. You know? And so, and, and his personality was kind of weak and, and uh, indecisive. And uh, so he was just not the man for the moment. And so the... the uh, in dealing with the you know economic problems of France and so forth, he flubbed it, and that that means to flub. So, uh, flub means he uh, was unsuccessful in pursuing the proper or making the proper decisions, and and uh, so he. Um, but the the so I'm saying that the economic problems could have been solved. Uh, they they were not insurmountable. Uh, but the, the main problem was the revolt of the intellectuals and the bourgeoisie, uh, the, the middle class against the, the social system of France and especially the faith. These people were very active. Voltaire, all of these horrid people that we're going to read about, very active in France. Uh, and the encyclopedists and so the, if you were anybody, it's just like today, you know, if you are a movie star or a basketball player or if you're rich, you're a Democrat. So if you were any of those things in the 18th century of France, an aristocrat, uh, in many cases, not all aristocrats, but you know, a lot of the prominent aristocrats, uh, a lot of the high clergy were infected with the ideas of the French Revolution um, the, uh, and some of the lower clergy too. Uh, infected with those ideas, uh, the um, uh, a lot of the nobles, like um, well, the general that won the Battle of Yorktown for us, Rochambeau, he was a big leftist during the French Revolution, and uh, also um, Lafayette, you know, vomit. Uh, the um, um, Many others, as a matter of fact, there were there was a whole there were so many young nobles that came over to help Washington, seeing this as sort of the beginning. Oh, there's a snake there. Huh, there's a snake climbing in there. It's like a snake in a tree. That's that's what started everything. Uh, <laughs> uh, the. Uh, uh, that Washington, so many of the, because they saw that as the new way, you know, the, uh, a, a country based on liberal principles. They came over, Washington had to send them back to France because he couldn't handle all of them. They were young officers who were aristocrats. So, you know, it, it, France was infected badly by all of these ideas, and Hume was part of it. Yes, Pop. Uh, so Condillac, now we have the Etienne Bonneau de Condillac. Uh, he was a priest. He was the younger brother of Abbé de Mably. Ab Abbé de Mably was one of the members of the intellectual scum of 18th century France. All right? He also was a priest. He was horrible. We won't talk about him here, but we talk about him in the other modern errors course, the Abbé de Mably. So he's the younger brother and associated in his youth with Rousseau, Diderot, Duclos, and all of them philosophes. I mean, just uh, intellectual cucarachas uh, of, of, of France, you know, the bottom of the, of the cesspool uh, of, of, of thought. An attitude, right? He later dissociated himself from them in a quiet way. Condillac's philosophical ideas are very much a reaction to the idealism of Descartes, Malebranche, Leibniz, and Spinoza. We'll see some of them. Notable disciples of Condillac are Carbanis and Destu. Uh, I don't know how you would pronounce the stut, perhaps uh, two T's, the tracy. Neither of those people are very important, really. or is very important. Like Locke, he admits 
sensation and reflection, which goes beyond sensation. But he goes a step further. He attempts to prove that sensation is not only the origin of ideas, but is the origin of the faculties themselves. So you know, your thought is your sensation, or your, your intellect is your sensation. He reduces all of the acts of the intellectual faculty to being attentive. And all of the acts of the appetitive faculty, meaning the will, to desiring. So he confuses the act with the faculty. But these two things, being attentive and desiring, are nothing else than sensation, he says. Conclusion, the faculties of the soul are nothing more than sensations. So that reduces us to animals. The ego of each man is merely the collection of sensations which he is undergoing and which his memory recalls to him. So it's your collection of memories. That's who I am. It is merely the consciousness of what is happening now and of what has happened to him in the past. Animals have that. They have a certain sensitive consciousness. And they, you know, like for example, elephants, remember a long, long time. <clears throat> in accordance with his sensualism, Condillac places a great deal of importance upon language since the word is what evokes understanding, which you couldn't have in his system. Try talking to a dog, for example. The only thing, in fact, which distinguishes our intelligence from that of the animals is the use of language. For Condillac, science is nothing else than a well-made language. Pleasure and pain are the only things which move the actions of the soul. So ideas of goodness and morality, you know, no, just pleasure and pain. Furthermore, the soul has no intrinsic activity, no personal activity, and has no free will. Human intelligence is not a power which is superior to the senses, but rather the only thing which distinguishes human beings from the animals uh, is, is that humans speak. So that's the only thing that makes us different from the animals, that we speak. Nonetheless, in his work entitled Treatise on Sensations, Condillac quite illogically affirms the spirituality and the liberty of the human soul. Like, where does he get that from? The existence of God, the free creation of the world, as well as virtue and moral duty. Maybe he would have been arrested if he didn't say those things. So, so he's, you know, but notice the reducing human beings to the world of animals and then the total inconsistency. Now, Voltaire. We talk about Voltaire more in the other course, but François-Marie Arouet, later Voltaire, said nothing original in philosophy. We have already examined his hatred for Christ and the Catholic Church, his blasphemies, and his writings, which did so much to bring about the French Revolution. So that's in the previous course. Inasmuch as he was a very popular man during his whole life, he did much to propagate the error of empiricism. For this reason, he deserves a place in the history of modern errors. Voltaire was extremely enamored with the ideas of John Locke. For Voltaire, Locke is the greatest of all the philosophers. Consequently, it is of no surprise that Voltaire is a sensualist and a deist like Locke. Voltaire is perhaps more materialistic than Locke. I don't think anyone could be any more of a materialist than Voltaire. <clears throat> it is difficult to analyze the thought of Voltaire since he contradicts himself constantly. 
he was just a devil in history. I mean, just a devil. On the one hand, he affirms the existence of God. On the other hand, he says that the existence of evil is incompatible with divine goodness and wisdom, which is typical of all uh, uh, atheists. Sometimes he speaks about the human soul, but he also calls it an abstraction made real. Like Locke, he admits that matter could possess the power to think. That's why you can have a pet rock. You talk to it. <laughs> the same sort of contradictions are found in his utterances about human liberty. His moral doctrines come from the English deists Woolston, Collier, Bolingbroke, Shakespeare, and others like him. Don't forget, he spent time with Bolingbroke. Voltaire remarks that Newton, Locke, and Clark would have been persecuted in France, imprisoned at Rome, and burned in Lisbon. This zeal for toleration did not, however, prevent him from expe expressing lively satisfaction when in 1761 he heard it reported that three priests had been burned at Lisbon by the anti-clerical government. Lisbon was in the hands of a what word to put on him? Someone by the name of Pombal. He was a. He made Hillary Clinton look good. Pombal. The king was an idiot. And so he was running Portugal. He was, I'm almost certain, a Freemason, or he should have been, if he was not. Uh, but he was extremely anti clerical. So Portugal was, was in the grips of a very anti-Catholic government at that time. So was Spain. Uh, less so than Portugal, but the, there was, there is, you see, you had in the courts, it wasn't necessarily the monarch so much, but the courts were loaded with, with Freemasons and anti-clericals. And, and uh, not good at all. Um, that's so, you know, why Spain pulled the Jesuits out of, out of South America. Um, and that will go right into the 19th century, too. So, um, so, um, so that's Voltaire. So he's not a big figure in philosophy, but he's a big figure in the corruption of the 18th century, particularly in France. He spent time with Frederick the Great, Frederick II of Prussia, also known as Frederick the Great, because he was a liberal and a Freemason. That's why they call him the Great. Frederick II of Prussia. So they were big friends. Frederick II was a, uh, he was a uh, Freemason. He was the one that designed the 33rd, 33 degrees of Freemasonry, Frederick II of Prussia. He's the one that stole Silesia. Right. Um, and uh, and then grabbed some of Poland you know, when everybody was grabbing. <clears throat> Rousseau, he's another one that is not big in philosophy, but he deserves honorable mention. He, uh, he was a debauched idiot. That's the only way you could say it. And he didn't say anything that was probably his own, you know, but he was popular and a writer and had a great influence. To this day, he has a great influence. So we have already examined in the previous section the life and political ideas of Jean-Jacques Rousseau. 
his political philosophy was his main work. And that was the, um, um, the social contract, which really originated with Locke. That's why I said he didn't write anything really new. Uh, but he popularized Locke and the social contract that power belongs to the people and that uh, the, there's a social contract between the government and the people. The government runs the country by the consent of the people, by a contract, and that power remains with the people and that the uh, general will is, is supreme, that means the majority, and that you preserve your liberty by consenting to the general will. See, even if you're against what, what you see, say you're, you're against something, higher taxes, if the general will wants it, you submit your will to the general will and you're free. In other words, you're, you know that you're doing the right thing. That's Rousseau. We do that in Catholic political philosophy. <clears throat> Otherwise, he followed the naturalism, skepticism, and deism, which was then fashionable. For Rousseau, morality is reduced to a natural dictate and instinct of the individual conscience, which has no basis either in reason or religion. See that divorce again of religion from reason. He's also the first real romantic Romanticism has its origins in Rousseau and other, other philosophers of this time. Yes? What's romanticism? Romanticism is a movement uh, very much associated with the 19th, 8, 19th century. It really blossomed in the 19th century where human feelings were put on a pedestal as supreme. and where reason was not to be trusted as much as human feeling. It produced, uh, in music, it produced a Beethoven, for example, uh, Mendelssohn, and Wagner. Uh, in, in Beethoven, if you compare, Beethoven was a student both of Mozart and Haydn. If you compare them, Mozart and Haydn are supremely rational in their music. Subdued and rational. Beethoven is uh, boom, boom, wham, boom. You see, and you know, double the size of the orchestra. You know, there's 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 ten cellos and there's ten double basses and there's there's ten French horns. You see, double the size of the orchestra and then boom, boom. You know, the, the, everything that that's it's all it's feeling. You see, you go to a Beethoven concert. And you get all riled up, you know, you, you know, you just feel it. Whereas you go to a Mozart or Haydn concert and it's all intellectual. So you say, that's a beautiful thing. It, it's all perfectly organized and melody and development, etc. The same with Bach. It's all intellectual. But the, one of the reasons for Beethoven's popularity is all of that feeling that he puts in it. And he gets you riled up, you know, something. Like uh, Fifth Symphony, you know, it's, it's and you know, it's always some sort of struggle with Beethoven. Everything is a struggle. It's it's you know, they they is no peace in Beethoven. <laughs> and and then there's always the devil in Beethoven. He's always got this bass line going. <laughs> there's always some sort of bass line that is the devil. He was a revolutionary. He was a leftist, terrible leftist. His first work was some sort of the funeral music for Joseph II, who was a supreme Freemason, the emperor of Austria. And all of these praises of his liberalism and everything, I heard it once, it was awful. So, and you know about the Eroica Symphony, you know the famous story. He wrote his third symphony, which is his best, in honor of Napoleon, 
who was spreading all of the junk of the French Revolution all over Europe. And he thought, this is great. You know, Europe will be now revolutionized. Well, when Napoleon made himself emperor in 1804, because then he called the, the, the he originally called that the Eroica Symphony, meaning heroic. He ripped the page out because Napoleon made himself a monarch, essentially. So he was no longer a Democrat. That was Beethoven. So there's a little, yes. So, but that's romanticism. So you see it in music, uh, the idea of painting pictures with music and feelings like Debussy, the typical romantic, you know, the afternoon of a fawn. Uh, so you're supposed to think of a fawn, you know, a, a baby deer in the woods, and he's writing music to, you know, accompany your imaginations about a baby deer in the woods. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> uh, in in literature, you're going to see idealizations of characters like Ivanhoe, that's Sir Walter Scott, who was a Freemason. Uh, the um, other, other uh, feelings, you know, like the Bronte sisters, you have that crazy Wuthering Heights where you have two people screaming, th running through the moors of Yorkshire, screaming at each other, basically. It's all feeling. So it's, it's the, everything that has to be feeling. From Wagner, you know, the, all the, the <laughs> you know, all the Sturm and Drang of Wagner and, it, it's a it's feeling. It's the exaltation of feeling over reason. You see, the 18th century was had uh, very much a a, uh, a rule of reason. And so the 18th century, especially late 18th century, you saw the uh, style of Louis the Sixteenth in furniture, architecture. It was more uh, restrained than the Rococo of of Louis the Fifteenth. Rococo was Baroque gone crazy where it lost even its classical lines and it was just it looked like a wedding cake or something, just a big gold cake or something. Uh, so that, the reaction came in the 1760s and everything went very classical and reasonable. See, so the Louis XVI furniture in comparison to Louis XV furniture, the Louis XV furniture has you know, legs like this, you know, very fancy, everything's all fancy and, you know, and all. Uh, Louis the Sixteenth, very, very classical. The legs are like columns and then the, the back of the chair is like that. That's because it was an age of reason. See, and, and, uh, and that's, you had Mozart and Haydn writing very reasonable uh, music. But then that, the reaction to that was feeling, see, and, and Rousseau is the first romantic, really. So that's a whole other course, is that and stuff. But. And romanticism destroys reason. So it's again a, this idea that, uh, that uh, the, the, it's something like that divorce of the inside from the outside. You see, everything is what's in me. You see, what's going on in my head, what's going on in my body. What's, you see, that, that's... Uh... Uh, his skepticism can be seen in the contradictions which one uh, finds in his writings. On the one hand, he lavishly praises the gospel and Christianity, at other times, he holds it in contempt. He both condemns and excuses adultery, of which he was guilty. He writes for and against the duel as well as suicide. Both for and against it. He was a nut. Rousseau's social contract is merely a development of Locke's work on civil government, his deist ideas can find their source in Locke's reasonable Christianity. His ideas on education found in Emile can be found in Locke's on education. So, as I said, he was not original. He was not very bright and not very talented. He was extremely immoral and ended up crazy. He was seen on the streets of Paris doing crazy things and then died. He was probably crazy his whole life. So, 
That's Rousseau, but big influence on modern, modern thought. Jean-Jacques Rousseau. And then he was uh, Swiss, so don't blame him on the French. He was Swiss from Geneva. This part. <laughs> See, the French will say the revolution was not from the French. See, it was from other people. So the... <laughs> The encyclopedists, although the encyclopedists were all French, tous français, we must nevertheless ascribe their ideas to the English. Voilà. During the reign of Louis XIV, English literary figures would sojourn in France in order to complete their education. Later, the French began to do the same in England. They would go to England to learn all of their garbage. Voltaire is a perfect example of this phenomenon. It is he that makes the doctrines of the English deists so popular in France. Very true. This foul influence of the English deists will contribute strongly to the widespread corruption of public morals in France during the 18th century and is at least partially to blame for the satanic outrage with which the philosophes will write against the church in the same century. Yes? Was Voltaire French? Ah oui, mais oui. He was probably the illegitimate son of a priest. The clergy were also immoral. at the, Not all, but there was a good deal of immorality among the clergy. The encyclopedia was a work constructed entirely for this purpose, that is, the destruction of the Catholic faith. It sought to infect all levels of society with the hatred of the Holy Gospel and of the Catholic Church. The principal authors of the encyclopedia were Voltaire, Diderot, and D'Alembert. The collaborators were Maupertuis, the Abbe Reynal, no, Reynal, uh, Grimm, La Maîtrie, Helvetius, Toussaint, Dolbach, whose house served as a meeting place for the philosophes, Robinet, which means Fawcett, who after the revolution returned to the faith, Nejon, author of many articles in the encyclopedia, Condorcet, who was imprisoned by the revolution and committed suicide, Montesquieu, Saint-Lambert, and Volney. So none of the I mean, no one's a, a big hitter in philosophy here, but it's just names to know. These these names come up and you know just so they you know who they are when you see those names. 